Hello everyone, my name is Yanni Adoni and I will talk today about Glevo simulations for manufacturing process optimizations. Um, I currently work at University West uh, in Trollhattan, Sweden, in uh, Joel Andersen's uh, group. He presented a couple of months ago some work on Glebo he did in developing different super alloys. But formerly I worked at the Turner University in Longview, Texas as well as USD research in Pennsylvania, as well as when I did my PhD at Ohio State. So my work with Glebo goes back to those days, I think 1986 or 87, when I first saw my Glebo, first Glebo there. So I will be presenting something which is a little bit different from the previous works because it's about so-called and real life uh, simulations. For those who don't know where University West is, is into, the, into a small town north of Göteborg, uh, which is Sweden's second largest city here on the western side of Sweden. It's a charming little place. Uh, I worked there with many uh, wonderful people who were there part-time, full-time that you might know, Americo Scotti or Francis or Norbert Erzinger. Uh, Asun Valiente, so I uh, work with wonderful people and enjoy being there. So the Glebo I'm um, using there through the graduate students, of course, uh, is, is an 3800 model. Um, we're working right now on simulating very low heat input additive manufacturing laser metal deposition, like 0.1 kilojoules per millimeter, very, very low heat input as well as some friction stir welding uh, versus fusion welding in aluminum alloys for automotive applications. But as far as the work in manufacturing optimizations, we talk about 25 years of experience and I gathered a couple of them here. Uh, they are different though from uh, those that you heard before and I know there were 40 something presentation you heard. Uh, they are shorter and simpler at least apparently. They take uh, maybe up to 12 months on average, sometimes 24 months. Uh, funding uh, was also between 50 to 100,000, sometimes 200,000. Uh, the processes that we simulated were not that well known and you need really to instrument and discover what you're trying to simulate really. And uh, you have to also figure out what critical parameters are uh, to do some maybe um, the Gucci analysis to find out weight factors between those parameters that you're trying to simulate. And then when you're done, you have to implement them right away. So you have people nervous, uh, yelling at each other, validation issues, credibility, and uh, you have to prove whether you're success or failure. So I'm trying to present, of course, those who were, <laughs> which were successes. I'm just kidding. So from many uh, examples from real life, Glebo uses, I, I picked a couple, actually three. Uh, this wasn't one of them. Uh, centrifugal casting of bimetallic hot strip mill rolls. So this is, uh, these are huge rolls that uh, uh, have a uh, high strength steel core, I'm sorry, shell, uh, which is poured centrifugally. And then uh, after uh, some time, uh, the inner core, which is tough and softer, is a, 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 core, a iron, nodule iron core, which is poured inside this shell. Um, we simulated uh, the, the, the interaction between the uh, hot metal, uh, liquid metal in, inside the cylinder and the shell in the Glebo, believe it or not. Uh, so it was very interesting work. I'm not going to talk about that, although there was quite interesting. Flame reheating, that's another one, very different. Here you have flame reheating not used for straightening but actually curving uh, girders and uh, and bridges. If you wonder that those huge uh, bridges, how do they basically turn so smoothly? Well, you had to flame bend them or straighten them. And so we did some simulations on toughness and the different uh, material grades, QNT, Quench and tempered versus thermomechanically controlled process steels. I will talk about the hot strip mill process optimization. This was really interesting because uh, we had to uh, look into the closed loop uh, feed forward 
algorithms versus feedback algorithms and, and simulate those process of processes that was interesting. I hope you like it. Uh, I will also talk about the high frequency weld bond line optimization. I will also talk about this one, hydrogen induced cracking and heat input optimization. Um, but there were a couple of others, liquid metal embrittlement, for instance, LME, uh, supporting experiment for other larger projects. Uh, this was uh, basically um, applying uh, thermocycles in which the hot dip uh, coating, hot dip zinc coating on the material would melt and uh, wet the grain boundaries and, and uh, under tension. Or well, stress relief cracking susceptibility, which is also an interesting one um, that you can do to look at the reduction in ductility with uh, post, post weld heat treatment. Others were related to um, wettability. For instance, we had an aluminum silicon brazing MIG welding that had to be uh, better understood and to see what the zinc coating effects are on wettability and atmospheres. Uh, another one on atmospheres was about the oxygen content uh, and, and our surface roughness effect on wettability of uh, welding nickel based superalloy. This was for a, a nuclear reactor application. A uh, fairly recent one was the uh, flooding of the chamber with nitrogen and looking at the austenite to ferrite ratio in duplex stainless steel um, by differentiating solid state uh, uh, exposure to nitrogen versus the uh, arc and melting related. Uh, and the one that I mentioned before, the currently involved in additive manufacturing and friction star welding simulations. Uh, which are supporting uh, larger research projects. So there, I think I've been involved in more than these, but um, that I kind of kind of set the stage for what these really are. So here is Mario Battaglia, one of my favorite uh, celebrity chefs. Uh, I learned from him and others that they have a very interesting principle of deconstructing existing dishes into basic ingredients and taking an existing, fairly not exciting dish and then reconstruct those ingredients into a better dish. And this is really what I use this principle for many years uh, because my, my take on this, and that this is modified celebrity chef by me, is deconstructing the processes, the real processes into sub-processes. Then identifying the critical parameters for each sub-process and then simulate the sub-processes in the Gleeble, and then try to optimize parameters within the Gleeble, and then the most difficult one to validate those and reconstruct these improved sub-processes into a better manufacturing process. So I will give a couple of examples of this deconstruction, reconstruction effort. And I told you about high frequency welding. So, What's in this high frequency welding really is a, a fairly complicated process called ERW welding, electric resistance welding, uh, by many is known, to, uh, is works for uh, welding long seams in tubular products. And it's really very good for uh, mostly, mostly ferrous alloys. Here you can see the top view of a, of a pipe being bent and welded uh, with contact uh, um, in, instead of induction contact, uh, at, at, well, that, this is actually high frequency induced uh, temperature gradient, and then it's forged together into weld. And so, when you look at the real process, it's really complicated. It has power, um, line power, local power at the, at, the, at the equipment, frequency, very important, line speed, the angle at which we call this V angle at which these are brought together, impeder position, total offset, and then what kind of temperature gradient you have. So taking those and to translating those into global input parameters takes some effort because what you have here, a deformation, you can translate that into strain and strain rates. You can uh, collect information or from models from peak temperatures and heating and cooling rates. You can simulate the gap, obviously, the different materials types. And then 
when you output these and compare and validate with weld geometry, microstructure, so forth, and try to then reconstruct it in the real process. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a quite a unique uh, exercise uh, completed uh, more than a decade ago at the Turner University in which we combine a brand new 100 kilowatt variable frequency welder from Thermotool with the Gleeball which we uh, remove the safety chamber and uh, instead of heating it resistively we used it either use the real uh, variable frequency power source to uh, weld samples in the Gleeball. Um, so we used the Gleeball mostly for the mechanical part, the data acquisition. We had several cameras recording temperatures. Uh, we had calibration experiments, so forth. But in essence, uh, the uh, power was provided by the high frequency uh, heating and then the deformation was provided by the Gleeball. In reality, it looked my, a little more complicated. We built the safety cage and then we had the 1500 model with this uh, uh, power source reaching in, uh, pretty complicated controller. Several of my wonderful past students, Mitch Plant, who works now at a high tech company in Dallas, and Steve uh, uh, Wolbert, who used to work at Arriva and now at another nuclear company in Virginia. Uh, one, lots of lots of students worked on these projects and. Uh, and, and uh, I think they enjoyed themselves, but they stayed safe. So basically we had the safety cage around it. And then you can see here a close up of what happens in the Gleeball during the heating of that sample and being basically pushed together and then welded. So the inputs were thermal and mechanical. Bone and behold, we set up power, frequency, time, calls to sample distance and, and then calculated from that heat input, effective power, and measured actual frequency. Mechanically, the initial and final position of the Gleewood jaw, displacement, final position, basically calculated the upset rate, total upset, and you can see that we looked at quite a wide variety of ferrous and non-ferrous materials in this experiment to try to understand each individual effect of these uh, variables. Here is an example in which you can see up close, uh, this is a DP600 dual phase advanced high strength steel being welded uh, inductively with a coil around it. Uh, powers were pretty serious, uh, 45 kilowatt, that's, that's pretty, pretty significant. Uh, we welded several other samples up to 75 kilowatts. Uh, we could use different frequencies though. This was quite impressive. Uh, in the ferrous materials, we used up to 500 kilohertz. For the non-ferrous, we used up to 900 kilohertz. So that was really a wide range of frequencies which people don't commonly see. And then we varied the gap before welding between zero and three millimeters. And then typical output would look like this. Uh, the raw thermal data was mostly from the IR cameras and, and the films from which we, we could calculate not only peak temperatures, but measure, but also temperature gradients. And then uh, from the mechanical, we get the global total displacement uh, force. So we get stress and strain. We would then put together in uh, time increments, all these heating rates, strain rates, and then we would do post-well testing. Uh, so this is how it looked like a typical input-output uh, format. Here were, here were the input parameters from frequency to power to gap, offset, displacement, so forth. And then heating rates calculated, uh, peak temperatures, and then the temperature, uh, the, the heating rates increasing here uh, at a break at a QD point when the uh, hysteresis loss uh, heating turns mostly into eddy current heating. And then we can see temperature gradients, so not only heating and cooling rates, but you can see temperature gradients uh, along the sample. Uh, every weld was uh, simulated, weld was cross-sectioned, the heat affected zone, the thermomechanical process zone, then the total heat affected zone width and microstructures were compared with actual welds. And we also uh, recorded uh, the compression, so zero, this is going into compression and uh, after it solidifies the weld, basically this is the final 
uh, reaction. Here, here is a temperature gradient, for instance, from the center of the weld. We could come up down to show the uh, temperature gradients uh, depending on the power. So uh, the more the power increase from 32 kilowatt to 74 kilowatt, you can see how the temperature increased from you know, almost 200 degrees centigrade. Uh, and then we had, I can't report on everything, but bottom line, this, this is one paper that uh, people still read today from 2009, in which uh, uh, one of my former students, Richard Baumer, who then went to MIT and finished his PhD and worked down at Dow Chemical, we wrote a paper in the Welding Journal, which is still cited almost daily, uh, because this is a very interesting work which shows uh, how uh, the heating rate changes at the QD point practically slows down. So this is far from linear um, in, in this very, very short period of time, a couple of seconds, uh, different materials, different, uh, but, but the trend is the same. By the way, Richard uh, is now uh, leading the program, which I retired from in 2017. I'm very, very proud that he's doing extremely well there and he's the program leader. So if you have a welding related problem, please talk to Richard. Uh, he knows the Gleeble in and out. Wonderful young man. Uh, so it was a bonus. I call this a bonus because many of these projects turn more into research. Uh, there was uh, another young man, Josh, Josh Swenson, who was really good. Together with Jerrica Cadman, they did a lot of optimizations between the finite element model and the experiment. And they constantly optimized the uh, uh, thermal and the mechanical effects. And uh, when you're going to watch this uh, slowly uh, later, you can see that the metallography comes up with parameters that you compare with the DOE analysis of the finite element model, and you, you fine tune the microstructure hardness profiles and the uh, fusion between the samples up to the point when you come up with the thermal and data analysis, and you constantly compare that with the thermal gradient from the model and therefore come up with a, a better understanding of the process from a thermal and mechanical standpoint by using this setup. So it was something that uh, was worthwhile doing from a research standpoint, not only from practical real time, real life. So the main deliverable, deliverables were basically this. The well frequency really had an overwhelming effect on the, uh, uh, on the weld quality and uh, definitely uh, we have established frequency ranges which were optimized for several base metals. The project represented basically the stepping stone, uh, uh, one of the most sophisticated HAZ control technologies by Thermotool Corporation. <clears throat> and that's why we couldn't talk about it for, <clears throat> excuse me, almost 12 years. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, certainly it, 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 it benefited the, the company. Um, we also wrote that uh, paper on hysteresis loss heating versus eddy current heating <clears throat> with Richard Baumer. We also uh, looked at dynamic recrystallization, a paper which uh, Robert Work and Josh Swanson co-authored with me. So this was all in all a very successful piece of work. Um, so without further ado, let me skip to the second one, uh, hot strip mill. The hot strip mill, it was a particular problem. A steel company came to us that we still cannot tell what was the proprietary steel composition, but it was something to do with a, uh, a, a very hard and brutal microstructure, which you normally don't see in these structures. It's called Widmash Tetan Ferrite. Widmash Tetan Ferrite is that little lamellar structure here, rather acicular, I'm sorry. As, a, as opposed to a protectoid ferrite, which is here to the left. And that's, that's really annoying because toughness decreases when the more Widmas that in ferrite appears. And that's why we had to, uh, to try to attempt to, um, to eliminate that. And this was, I still remember Ben Pletcher, who might be listening now, who was, uh, was now at Bechtel Corp, welding engineer and uh, doing wonderful things uh, in his company. 
uh, how how well and how thorough he was in in completing this work because we had to translate this very complicated thing in an ostrich mill you have a slab comes in at a certain temperature and thickness and then at each stand is reduced and it has a different temperature so the speed continually increases when the time it comes out on the other end it goes like a runaway train so this is a really really uh, dynamic process you see each of these strands stands this happens to be seven but there are sometimes more and how on earth are you going to simulate each of these so we had to go out and try to measure from their computer data and their uh, data acquisition on what we had to simulate so we basically looked at temperature history strain rates uh, percent called hot work at each stand and then tried to look at and isolate the thermal from mechanical strain history. So remember the, the celebrity chef, chef principle. We, we were able to keep mechanical constant and very thermal, or we can keep thermal constant and very mechanical, something that they cannot do on the mill. And then try to find the temperature and strain parameters and reconstruct the optimized heating and cooling rates and going back to the strip mill, hot strip mill with it. So in order to do that, uh, ben was the main author, so I just keep referring to Ben Pletcher doing wonderful work and, and even uh, trying to understand the difference between the tensile and compressive loading on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the composition and Widman set and ferrite. You can see to the left uh, tensile and to the bottom right compressive loading and then uh, doing it uh, the way everybody does it, uh, image image analysis and finding Widman and ferrite uh, highlighted here so that the computer did the work. And when uh, all was put together, the, the Widman Staten ferrite volume uh, fraction was seen to increase clearly with temperature. As you can see, uh, thermal only, which without any compression, of tension, it increased the volume fraction from practically nothing at 900 degrees centigrade to almost 100% at 1150. When you added uh, compressive, uh, I mean tensile to it, 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 it exacerbated things a little bit because you can see that uh, sometimes it actually, because of tension and compression, more Widmanstedt and ferrite uh, was produced than only from thermal. Uh, but in essence, the thermal prevailed. You can see here that when you have a, a, the U, U notch, the, the Widman Staten ferrite increasing with temperature volume fraction, and the, the toughness decreasing almost consistently with the amount of Widman Staten ferrite. And the break, break up point is about 1000 degrees centigrade. So if you can do everything under that temperature, basically it turned out that the temperature had an overwhelming effect on Widman Staten ferrite, even though we varied uh, cooling rates, heating rates, tension, compression. Uh, in essence, uh, uh, the cooling rate also had an effect, um, but it was, it was basically only after you done uh, rolling, uh, the Widman Staten ferrite basically increases within this range and then it decreases when you, so at, at very low heating rates, I'm sorry, low cooling rates and high cooling rates, Widman Staten ferrite also decreases. And so that was the second uh, important conclusion because it was clear that uh, the effects of heating cooling rates on Widman Staten ferrite uh, were uh, uh, identified. Uh, and then we find optimized and heating and cooling rates and then the correlation with Widman Staten ferrite was established, and then we tried to feed these uh, in the hot, hot strip mill computer. But I'll tell you, here we had a problem with the customer interest, and I'll tell you why. Because in a decreasing order of uh, uh, importance, uh, the temperature was limited to about 1,000 degrees centigrade in our recommendation. The cooling rates at the exit were to be increased to 200, 250 centigrade per minute, which is not very high, but it requires uh, forced cooling. And then uh, we also found that the, at lower strain rates, with and ferrite uh, definitely decreased. So 
Uh, why was this a problem? Is because the exit cooling rate required a lot of capital investment. You can see here real cooling beds here where the product, but this happens to be from different pictures, sorry. This is a bar product, this is a sheet product. I just wanted to illustrate for those who don't know, it was the same thing uh, in that mill, which I cannot recreate here. But basically, you can see that the, the, the product was piling up here, and it was cold, uh, hot and then colder uh, as, as you moved away. So the cooling rates were not controlled. Nothing wrong with it, but they were not controlled. Uh, individual strips had to be separated for our case, and that would require a lot of investment and, and forced cooling and real estate, and basically making the hot strip mill longer. So there were some limitations to our recommendations. So here, here is what happened. So we asked them to roll in lower temperature. Well, they didn't like that because the roll wear is increased and you can even break it at those temperatures. So they all prefer to run at higher uh, temperatures, sometimes 200 degrees centigrade higher than what we recommended. Uh, the exit cooling rates were not accomplished. It was not accomplishable because it required investment, capital investment and force cooling. So that was again going against their interest and against their uh, financial. Uh, and then low strain rates basically meaning lowering the hot strip mill speed and lowering uh, productivity. So no matter what we recommended went against their uh, interest. So uh, we still persuaded them to do the lower uh, rolling temperature and lower speeds and Already the Widmanstedt and ferrite went down to by 50 to 60 percent, but they could not uh, increase the cooling rate at the exit bed. So uh, basically uh, they used the uh, separate post rolling and knee land accelerated cooling to completely eliminate Widmanstedt and ferrite. So in the end, economic consideration prevailed and no matter how what we found, it was not implementable. So this was a partial success. We solved the problem. We know exactly what the problem was. We knew how to solve it, but it was impossible to be implemented. So ex except for uh, the fact that the old, at, at the end of the study, the whole plant personnel felt they understood their process much better after the study. So sometimes this was a bitter, bittersweet uh, uh, conclusion and that, you know, typically people don't like to talk about uh, because, you know, many times you work really hard and you actually understand what's going on and then you can't implement it. But ultimately, uh, I think that the, the management became much more comfortable with their own process and with their own controllers at the end of the study. And yes, they did have a solution. If they needed lower to improve the toughness, they would do offline heat treatment, and that's all. And the rest they would sell uh, uh, as, as is to other customers. So that was the second one, bittersweet. Well, I hope that the third one and the last one I'm going to talk about is going to uh, be more up to your liking. It's about hydrogen induced cracking prediction simulations using the Gleeble. This is part of a larger program, high performance steel development, 70W and 100W using bridges. It was an extensive study uh, funded by the American Iron and Steel Institute together with Federal Highway Administration in which we had National Steel Bridge Alliance and AASHTO participate as members and we were under the guidance of the NFC Carderog Division Surface uh, Warfare Center. Uh, actually, Johnny Deloach was our uh, committee um, a chairman for many years. Uh, Alex Wilson, Dr. Barson were the ones who started it. Wonderful people I worked with during this time. So what's really special about this, like you might not notice that this is actually a bridge which has only one column here in the center, protected by uh, uh, guardrails. Uh, it's missing the so-called danger zone. So this is where people uh, actually collide mostly with the extra column on, on the side of the road uh, when they fall asleep or something. So that's really, from a safety standpoint, it's really important that it doesn't have those columns on the side because it can, uh, because of the highest strength, it can actually take longer spans. So what are these high-performance steels? Uh, these are basically uh, 
70, 100 KSI. So it's like 700 uh, megapascal uh, strength materials. Uh, and they also have a weathering characteristic. The Rusty Tower, the tallest building, this one here, uh, right now is renamed UPMC, 62 stories high building, which I visited many, many times during my US tier days. Uh, is made out of this, built in 1971, it did not corrode a bit. Uh, it's really interesting that the tenacious iron oxide which develops on it guarantees up to 100 years of service life. Uh, with with minimal copper and nickel addition, so mostly copper is what does the trick. And um, uh, this is a uh, it was a uh, it was a trade it was a patent U.S. Steel had. I actually knew the gentleman, Dr. Don Kim, who developed this at U.S. Steel Research. Extremely got good toughness and also had low hardenability uh, and processed either quenched and tempered or thermomechanically controlled process. So what's really the problem here? Uh, if this is a wonderful steel and easy to weld, when you build bridges out of it, it's really, really complicated to preheat them to avoid hydrogen induced cracking. You can see a gentleman to the right preheating something. You can, it can takes a lot of time and very careful control of preheat temperatures. Uh, if you try to do that on a huge girder like shown on the left, uh, you, ha you have uh, uh, problems. Uh, some people actually uh, attach large uh, uh, burners in front of the welding tractors, which really do more damage than good when they try to uh, preheat going together with the welding uh, um, carriage. So that's really a problem for these, these sections. So what's really the issue here? Uh, cold cracking, hydrogen induced cracking basically uh, occurs only when you have four conditions present. Diffusible hydrogen is one, a degree of restraint and residual tensile stresses, heat effect is on hardness about 300 vickers or so, and ambient temperature when hydrogen uh, basically causes it to crack. So from these, HAC hardness is only one of the four measures. So you still have to <coughs> um, take care of the other three, but in this work, we did take care of the rest, but for what I'm going to report is mostly HAC hardness, as well as uh, a, a, a basically cooling rate, establishing cooling rate at which hardness drops below 300 Vickers. But then there was the HAC toughness, which also is being affected by those cooling rates. So that's basically how can we uh, explain this. Uh, when you have a weld, uh, you have two different tests to check for hydrogen induced cracking. One is called the Tekken test or the Y groove in which uh, uh, you weld it within a Y and then the heat effector zone cracking uh, progresses. It's a self-restraint test uh, and uh, you can tell, you know, what's the limiting preheat and hydrogen diffusible hydrogen level at which this is 100% cracked, of course, but they are, you know, eventually you can preheat to the point when, when and, and use low hydrogen content until cracking disappears. The second one, though, is the fusion zone cracking. There's, we did hundreds of these so-called GBOP tests and uh, many of the students involved, and I just want to remember out of the well, maybe 50 students whom I had involved in all this, uh, they had uh, 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 the, uh, sorry, when you had the uh, uh, ability to, to do this uh, back in the uh, mid-90s, then uh, Nathan Nisley and uh, uh, who works at Exxon Research and Seth Norton, who's at BP Research, uh, so many students, uh, you know, that's one of the incredible benefits of working on these innovative projects is that you, you have the privilege to work with many, many wonderful students. So they did a lot of work to quantify the cracking here and then, and then establish a minimum preheat, which really uh, was the, 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 the key question for these materials. Um, but then you had to look at how the... Uh, 
hardness and toughness in the simulated heat effective zone varied and going back to welding in which you have to basically translate those critical cooling rates into uh, heat input values. So we tried to implement a, a method in which we would uh, uh, eliminate preheating by using heat input uh, ranges. The low range would be where, you know, the uh, cracking uh, doesn't occur anymore without having preheating. So it's a limit minimum preheat uh, condition. So that would be a minimum uh, heat input control. So in order to do that, here are some examples for low and high heat input welding. Here are some examples of heat effective zone cracking. And here are some examples of microstructures in the coarse grain heat effective zone of a, one of the uh, 100W weather, weathering steel, uh, really uh, coarse grain and, uh, and massive uh, martensite high hardness regions. So we did a lot of, uh, I, I took this from the global paper. I mean, you will recognize basically uh, used different heat input values and multi-pass uh, uh, reheats to find out what's going on. Uh, and then we compared at 50 kilojoules, which would be about two kilojoules per millimeter to 150 kilojoules per inch, which is about six kilojoules per millimeter. And you can see how the coarseness of the martensite changes and obviously these become uh, coarser and harder. Um, but obviously as you increase the cooling rate, the, the, the martensite within those grains tempers and the hardness drops. So here is a, a comparison between two different types of uh, HPS 100W. You can see that the old uh, version exceeded 300 uh, Vickers, and the new version was much softer, uh, while the actual weld was somewhere around in between. Uh, so these uh, cooling times between 8 to 500 correspond to uh, uh, 50 kilojoules per inch and so forth. So the, as the heat input increases, obviously, you can see that the hardness decreases. So this was the key for the entire process. What is the threshold cooling rate that is the threshold heat input at which for a given diffusible hydrogen, you will not have cracking in the heat effective zone. And then, but then if you keep increasing the heat input, eventually you run into a toughness reduction problem. So you can see that as the, the heat input uh, increases, the toughness definitely decreases. So we had to mitigate the, the, the two heat inputs, one end uh, avoid hydrogen in this cracking and on the other end uh, 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 re avoiding low toughness. And we had to do the same thing for the fusion zone, by the, by the way. So in, in the end, we proposed a solution of using high heat input, which was liked by the bridge, bridge builders. And so uh, some of them did not like the 30 kilojoules per inch. They wanted to weld much fat, much uh, higher heat input. But basically we allowed them to not use uh, any preheat up to two inches thickness, which was quite a gutsy choice from us, uh, provided that was uh, H4, that is four milliliters per 100 gram diffusible hydrogen level. And, uh, and then uh, we, we set a higher upward limit. So basically, you can see the window between the 30 to 70 kilojoules per inch because at uh, higher heat inputs, the toughness decreased. And so this particular heat input range was used by many, many fabricators later on. Uh, it was well accepted. Uh, the global toughness was also very convincing because they were also very much superior to weld toughness. And uh, this uh, pre no preheat allowance was very, very popular. And uh, last I checked, uh, over 400 bridges and overpasses were made with 70W and 100W welded crack free in 20 years. Uh, the AI site keeps a very, very close look at all these. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a real success story, I might say. So overall, uh, what did I learn from all these simulations from which I presented three? I think that the advantages of doing the simulations for manufacturing is that 
really the wide variety of simulations from forging, rolling, casting, welding, and so forth. So this really, really is, is was one of the, something that my experience confirmed. The simulator is easy to program. It can provide results in timely manner, and it can be a great uh, learning tool. Uh, you can change inputs and outputs reliably and separately and reproducibly as compared to not reliable and not reproducible real life and constantly synergistical uh, variables. And finally, uh, the advantage was that uh, when you do some process improvements, you can lead into fundamental uh, research later on, as I alluded to. Uh, but there are some limitations in global, manufacture, uh, in global simulations for manufacturing. Uh, the simulations can only start when, when you really understand the process. If you don't understand the process and your critical pr pr parameters, then don't even start. Uh, the implementation can be risky. Uh, there will have to be a lot of risk takers on both sides, the simulators and manufacturing managers, because the operational envelopes are relatively narrow and there are lots of economic and other limitations like in the Hostrip mill example, which would uh, deem the project unsuccessful just because you do not have the ability to change anything or within the range. And the other disadvantage of this is that you've developed unique solutions which cannot be applied elsewhere. However, the mo motivation and the methodology can be reproduced. And uh, my hope is that those of you listening uh, will be inspired to do these kind of crazy uh, simulations uh, in the future. I also observed is that uh, because uh, non-disclosure agreements are involved, you always have restrictions on publishing and you have embargo time. So these are not very popular in academic circles where there's a lot of pressure on publication, so you have to be aware of that. Uh, but you also have to be aware that eventually it will pay off and you can write a lot after the embargo uh, process is complete. Customers are suspicious. Uh, some customers don't really understand. They uh, are very nervous and uh, they don't know how to, be, uh, to, to relate to this. They have to be risk takers. Then there are lots of safety issues, so, uh, so that was another but the final observation is that if successful implementation overrides all frustrations, and frustrations have been all along, and this is part of experimental research, and so I would say that it was all worth it. And uh, so, basically, in conclusion, I would I would say that the global systems can be effectively used, uh, and I think that even in short-term developments, they show great versatility. I I'm, I'm not advertising for the Gleewold brand, but I think that they have proven themselves in many uh, different environments. So I can definitely say that I would endorse uh, their systems, even for these type of operations or simulations. But you have to be aware that there will be uh, validation and implementation problems for these type of, of uh, simulations. Technical, financial, human relationships, Boy, I'll say, a lot of yelling goes on. When people are nervous, are you going to find the answer or not? So you have to be aware of those. And But the, the, what I learned in all these uh, simulations that in the end, even if you're not successful, the, the management becomes extremely assured about what they actually do. And really was o always a way to walk away from say, okay, well, maybe they weren't able to implement it, but they would know how to design their hot strip mill better next time, or they would know how to, to do the casting better next time, or flame reading. So overall, I think that uh, people walk away with better understanding of what they do from these simulations. To finish on a positive note, it is the picture of my grandchildren. Clear that uh, these projects had brought tremendous educational value to uh, <clears throat> the university, a lot of research value, mostly undergraduate research, although several of them went to get their degrees elsewhere. Uh, with a new master's program at Laterno, we had graduated at least 10 since then. 
but the industrial value was also great. So I would like to leave you with the positive thought. Here, uh, I, uh, I really appreciate your attention and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you.